Hey guys, Jared Wesley here of Live Traders and it is that time of the week. It is lecture time and this week's topic guys is when is it okay to be aggressive with a trade? Uh, I've been seeing a lot of trades online and people suggesting ideas to me in the chat room lately about one minute highs, one minute three bar plays, or these climactic plays, et cetera, and so forth. And I'm looking, I'm going, wow, that's a really aggressive trade. So I wanted to dig deeper inside the mindset and figure out when is it okay to be aggressive? Why are so many people suggesting aggressive trades? And then on top of that, is it always okay to take aggressive trades or is it never okay to take aggressive trades? Well, today we're gonna to discuss that. When would it be okay to take an aggressive trade? What types of things, what's the checklist that you need to go through to make sure that the trade you're taking is acceptably aggressive? Because there is such a thing as acceptably aggressive and unacceptably aggressive, okay? So it's a pretty good lecture. There's about 30 slides. It's a little bit longer than normal um, because I wanna really dig deep into this. There's a lot of minutia, a lot of detail detail into when you're allowed to do these things because otherwise you need to sit back. Some traders, and I think a lot of newer traders especially, they go right off the market open at 9.30, 9.31, 9.32, and they feel this FOMO in them. So they've been, you know, all this pent up aggression in the pre-market and they're like, as soon as the market opens, they're like, click, 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 click. And that's not the way to approach the markets. Now I'm not suggesting there aren't times you can do that, but there are very limited and very special times and situations that you can do that with. So today we're gonna discuss that, when it's okay, when it's not okay. If you like these videos, please. Please click that like button, smash, hammer that subscribe button. It'll help me out and I'd appreciate it. I am Jared Wesley of Live Traders. Let's get to it. This week's lecture topic is when is it okay to be aggressive? All right. So there are a lot of ways that you can trade, a lot of ways that you can approach the market. Some people are core traders, some people are micro scalpers on tick charts, one minute charts. Uh, some people are super aggressive with their approach, some people aren't. So I'm gonna take this, this topic within the context of intraday trading, specifically as it relates to kind of the market open, shorter, lower time frames like one and two minute charts, those types of things because I've been getting a few emails here and there, but some comments in the chat room uh, about, oh, that's aggressive, or they took an aggressive trade, trying to kind of get inside the mindset of a trader, if you will, um, and why does somebody want to be that aggressive on a trade, potentially? And when are you allowed to be aggressive? Are you ever allowed to be that aggressive? Is it acceptable to be that aggressive? Uh, and what's the outcome if you are that aggressive? Um, I'm choosing this topic uh, because I think there are a lot of traders that have FOMO, right? They come in and like they spend all this time in the pre-market and you know devising their watch list, their gap list, et cetera, and so forth. And they see an idea, they like it so much. It's like they can literally cannot contain themselves right when 9:30 happens. Like true story. I was at Dave and Buster with my son. It was his birthday yesterday and he could not contain himself. The second the one game ended, literally the second like the time ran out or you're finished, he's running, not walking, running to the next game. And it kind of got me thinking like, this is what traders do. The second the market opens, they're like, okay, it's, 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 let's get to it. And it's like, whoa, just because the market opened doesn't mean you got to push the button 22 seconds later. Right? The market is open all day until 4 p.m. Why do you have to take all those trades in the first one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes? Now, I'm not saying that you can't trade that time. I am simply saying, why is there so much pent up aggression to want to trade that time? And you know the answer to that is FOMO, fear of missing out on a, a larger move. And you're like, well, what if the stock pops $2 right off the open and I miss it? Well, what if it drops $2? Yeah, well, no, no, no. I only want to know the good stuff, right? And that time of the day tends to be very whippy and spready. But before we get into the lecture, I have a doozy for you today. Oh, I like these. When will the insanity stop must go on, okay? So this week's when will the insanity stop, like I said, is a bit of a doozy, okay? Ah, gosh, these are so enjoyable. Lost $2.3 million leverage trading, okay? Through some, quote, <clears throat> I'm laughing, but 
sort of, not really. Through some, quote, smart investments in crypto, <laughs> I turned 50,000 into roughly 2 million. Through some smart investments. Okay. Smart. So you basically made 40 to 1 on your money and you call that smart. I call that lucky. Now, some people might be like, you're just poo-pooing on somebody, Jared. No, you're going to find out why I call that lucky because we're going to see how this person really made that $2 million through gambling. Okay, so biggest winners being DAG and X. AXS, but that's irrelevant. Lately, I've gotten into leverage trading on an exchange called FTX, blah, 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 blah. Who cares? I'm also in multiple groups to bounce ideas from one another. I also did good before this. Well is the proper vernacular, but who cares? Turned the 2 million into 3.5. So basically, this person turned 50,000 into $3.5 million. Now, I know what you're thinking before we get to the end. Why didn't they just stop? You know why they didn't stop? Because the personality type and the mentality that's capable of turning 50,000 to 3.5 million doesn't allow you to stop. See, this is the problem. You guys are looking at this from a, an actual, like, normal person, objective perspective. No, you have to have something missing between the ears to turn 50,000 into 3.5 million in a short period of time. It's called gambling, all right? So that's why they don't stop. I mean, why didn't he stop at 100,000? Why didn't he stop at 500,000? Why didn't he stop at a million? There is no stopping, okay? This is what an addict looks like. This is what a gambler looks like. And if this person had turned that 3.5 million to 7 million, they still would not have stopped. This is what it's like being an addict and a gambler, okay? So apparently, see? apparently we were almost certainly due for a triple top rejection so what do you mean apparently did someone tell you that to use the word apparently someone must have fed you that information because of the way in which you typed it it sounds like you weren't super confident you were listening to other people's advice we were due for a triple top rejection at forty-five thousand, which would set us back to 40 so i shorted 20x wow 20x leverage forty-three thousand three hundred. okay Liquidation was at 46,000, okay? Wow, position was worth 1,000 Bitcoin, whatever. Let's skip all that and go to the good stuff. However, it did not turn out the way everyone predicted. Read that line again. It didn't turn out the way everyone predicted. So how do you think this person really made their money? By probably listening to Reddit or Wall Street Bets or some other online forum, some other group, hence Everyone predicted. That's how they made their money. You know how I use the phrase, don't spend that money because the market wants it back? Well, the market will take it back if you keep trading and treating it like that. So I got, a liquid, I got liquidated a couple of days ago. $2.4 million vanished into the ether. My total uh, portfolio is around $1.1 million now, and I'm feeling mentally destroyed. Why? Were, were you not feeling mentally lucky and great, elated when you turned 50 into 2 million? Why would you feel destroyed now? Did you think you could never lose? Well, I mean, that never crossed your mind that you might lose eventually. Never crossed your mind? I'm sure some of you here have gone through something similar. No, I have not. Okay, I'm sorry. Haven't. All right. So now I don't know if this is just a typing error. But the person says, how do I cope and get over this? My first instinct is to make another trade, to make it all back. Is the gambler in this person starting to become clearer and clearer and clearer as we go through this paragraph and read it? It's becoming more and more obvious who and what this person really is. But I'm too anxious to lose whatever I have left. See, I'm not sure if they meant to say I'm not too anxious to lose whatever I have left. Okay, since it's money, I'm unlikely to ever see again if I lost it. What does that also tell us about this person? This is not a rich person, right? The 50,000 was a lot of money to this person. Does it start now that you read the whole thing? Can you guys take a step back and recognize like who and what this person really is all about? This person is a gambler from day one, but when you turn 50 into three and a half million, everyone's like, great job, awesome job, man, that's incredible. No, no, no. You never deserved to make the three and a half million in the first place. You were gambling, you got lucky, and now guess what? Your luck streak has ended and it's catching up with you. 
Take the million dollars and run. Don't walk, run away. And actually tip your cap to the market and say, thank you, I was an absolute idiot. And I still walked away with a million dollars. It's not too often you get to be this dumb and still make a million dollars. So when this person says, I'm mentally destroyed, no, you should be dancing naked in the street. Thank you, stock market. I was a douche and I made a million dollars being the world's dumbest person. I'm not joking. You guys think I'm being mean right now. I am not kidding. Go dance in the street. You just made a million dollars doing the stupidest thing you could possibly do. You should be sitting here going, praise the Lord, I was dumb and he let me walk away with seven figures. But nope, that's not the way this person's thinking. I hope this person listens to this video and walks away. I swear I hope it. All right? So, that's, there are people out there like this every single day. They think somehow the 50,000 to the 3 million was skill. This is a gambler to the highest level. You, don't, you shouldn't be allowed anywhere near a trading account or anywhere near a casino. You're not mentally tough enough to handle it. And if someone does let you in there, let you in there with 10 bucks. That's it. Those are facts. People can get upset at me for how ad animated I get with this stuff, but this is real stuff, man. There's a thousand other stories where somebody took 50,000 and turned it into negative 50,000. We've seen those, okay? All right, let's dig in. I went a little longer on that than I wanted to, but I just, it, it's amazing to me the mindset that people have. Instead of saying how fortunate I am to be up a million dollars, they're regretful they're not still up three and a half, not looking at how they even got to a million. All right. What is aggressive trading? What does this look like? Okay. Taking a pre-market breakout, breakdown or a buy setup in the pre-market taking a one minute high or low, right? Taking a one minute three bar play at 9.33 in the morning, okay? Going directly against a gap that is not extended, hmm, right? Fading a gap that's not extended or into support or resistance. Going directly against the current market direction. But, but, but is what you guys are thinking. But, but we do these things sometimes, Jared. So that's the question. Does this mean we can never do these things? Does this mean we can't ever, or does this mean we can never? You pick your poison. No, the answer doesn't mean we can't do these things, but everything has to happen in context. So I guess the question today, the prevailing question we'll talk about as we go into this is, what would allow us, what situations or criteria would allow us to trade in the pre-market? to take a one minute high, to take a one minute three bar play, to go against the market. What scenarios would let us do this? Okay, well, we're gonna get to that. But before we do, what makes something so aggressive? Well, the type of gap, right? Is it a novice gap? Is it a pro gap? What makes it less aggressive? A level one gap makes it less aggressive. What's it make it more aggressive? A level three gap or something that's not even rated it so bad the time frame of the trade, but not always. See, you can have a one minute trade, one minute chart that's actually not aggressive at all, right? Depending on the time of the day or all the other things that we're talking about. But generally speaking, lower time frames, one minute, two minute charts are by nature more aggressive because they're by nature going to have tighter stop losses and it's easier to get whipped around as well as what? When you take something on a one minute chart or a two minute chart, you are lacking what? Information. By definition, you lack certain level of information. Because if you take a stock at 933 or 934, you don't really know how it's gonna trade that day. See, if you take it at 1034 or 1134, now you have one or two hours worth of information that you can pull from. But when you take it at 934, you have four minutes of information that you can pull from. Yes, I know, we have pre-market information, we have gaps, that's great. But you don't know how it will actually act, react until the market opens, right? So the time frame in which you take a trade on absolutely impacts the aggressiveness of it, okay? What type of trade? Ever take a climactic trade? They're generally pretty aggressive. They're whippy, they're volatile, why? Because it's almost definitely, not always, but almost definitely some form of news that comes out 
that creates that drop in a stock or that pop in a stock, right? When a stock pulls back 20, 30, 40%, it's not because people just woke up for no reason and said, yeah, I wanna get out of this. There's usually some type of negative information, accounting error, CEO gets fired, whatever it may be, that's the reason that the stock became climactic in the first place. Now, why does that make it aggressive? It makes it more aggressive because we don't know what the extent of that news is because we're not reading the news most of the time, we're reading the chart. So new news could come in and tank the stock again, and they tend to be whippy and wild, and it's also like a burning building. Everyone's trying to get through the same door at the same time. Well, not everyone makes it, right? Does that make sense? So it's chaos is what a climactic chart looks like, is basically chaos, okay? Low volume, low liquidity. Typically, what do you have to do to trade low volume and low liquidity stocks? You have to anticipate. Well, by nature, anticipating an entry is aggressive because guess what? The actual pattern hasn't physically formed yet. It's about to form, but it hasn't actually triggered yet until it actually triggers. So anticipating something is by nature more aggressive. Some more or less, depending on the time frame and by how much you anticipate it. If you anticipate a trade by a penny, that's different than anticipating a trade by 50 cents or a dollar, right? So low volume also is aggressive because they're typically spreadier, large spreads on stock. These kind of go hand in hand. So why is that more aggressive? Well, because the damage that could happen if it stops out, right? If it doesn't work, you're gonna take more slippage, therefore making the trade a little bit more aggressive. And a large spread is generally pretty whippy as well, which makes a stock more aggressive because you can get whipped in and out much easier. And once you start doing what, guys? Once you start taking these and putting them together, hey, I'm gonna take a stock with low volume, low liquidity, a large spread on a one minute time frame on a level three gap. Oh boy, oh boy. Now we're really starting to go, hmm, pump the brakes. We'll get to that in a minute. Market location. If you are going long, and we'll take a look at, don't worry, there's gonna be a chart example of just about every one of these things, okay, almost, all right? If you take a trade long and the market's seven 60 minute bars into resistance, that's aggressive. And you might be on a 15 minute chart. You heard me, I'll repeat it. You might be on what's considered to be a less aggressive time frame, like a 15 minute chart. But if you're taking a trade long and the market's up seven 60 minute bars in a row into a double top resistance point, then that could be construed as an aggressive trade regardless of the time frame in which you took it, okay? Market conditions. Hey, is there a 10 a.m. report? Is there natural gas coming out? Is there an FOMC coming out? And you didn't recognize it or realize it. It makes your trade massively aggressive because now you're just flipping coins, right? If you take Exxon Mobil five minutes before an oil report, that's a really aggressive play. I know it sounds obvious not to do that, but there are times we all get caught out, right? Management style and approach of, whoa, whoa, what do you mean my management style could be aggressive? Well, yeah, if you're doing a one minute bar by bar at 9.33 on a one minute three bar play, like it says down here, combinations of, above, of the above, the chance that you get stopped out for no gain or a small loss or a small gain is, is pretty big. That's a very aggressive management approach, right? A management style. Um, so my point is, is that these are all types of things that can make your trading much more aggressive, but they're not standalone. Most of the time, what makes your trade really aggressive is some combination of all of these things, like a one minute climactic with a widespread using a one minute bar by bar management. <sighs> That's tough. Climactics are some of the whippiest trades you're gonna get. And if you take it on a one minute chart, what are you getting the least amount of? Protection. Because the one minute suggests it's the tightest available stop loss, right? That's why you took it on the one minute. You wanted to get in earlier than waiting for a five minute. And why did you wanna get in earlier? You were concerned about the risk to reward, so you used a tighter stop loss. Well, it's a wide spread. It's a volatile stock. So doing that on a one minute by definition, by nature, makes it more aggressive. This isn't to say like the last slide that you can't do these things, but if you choose to, 
expectation needs to be consideration, right? It needs to be considered, okay? Let's take a look. And this is one of the last text slides till the end. Everything from here on out is going to be charts, and there's a lot of them, okay? So, <clears throat> when? When can we be aggressive? Pre-market charts with nice patterns and volume. One minute high and low with a level one gap. One minute three bar play with a level one grab and or extreme relative strength. Extreme relative strength or weakness with an extended market, for example, into support or a mega gap. So let's say you have a stock that's gapping down and the market's gapping up 3% into resistance. Ah, there's a real good chance that market's going to pull back and you're already looking at a stock that has relative weakness because it's gapping down. That's acceptable to be aggressive with. Okay, Climactic slash mega gap in a stock can take the other side of it, right? So if you have a mega gap, a 20% gap, and maybe that's into resistance, okay? You can take it, but just like the last slide, we're looking for combinations of these things. So for example, wouldn't it be really nice if we were gonna take a one minute high or low with a level one gap, wouldn't it be also really nice that that level one gap with the one minute high had a beautiful pre-market chart with crazy volume? We're just getting better. Think of it like this, right? When we trade, when we take a buy setup or a three bar play or a breakout, we have pattern boosters. We have bottoming tails, pictures of money, shakeouts, narrow body bars, support, resistance, trend lines, moving averages, right? We have all these things that make our trades better. Well, if you're going to be aggressive with something, do your best to take some form of combination trade where that one minute high is not just a one minute high, it's a one minute high with a level one gap that shows a great pre-market chart and possibly has great volume and relative strength to the market. Every one of those things makes continues to give you extra confirmation, which makes the trade more reliable and also turns it into a less aggressive trade, even though you're getting in at 9.31 in the morning. Okay, same with the extended market, extreme relative strength or weakness. Make sure that when you're taking that, perhaps wait for a pattern, wait for that one minute three bar play. Okay, you don't have to, but if you have extreme relative strength or relative weakness, maybe that stock has a really nice pre-market chart also. Same with the climactics, all right? So note, being aggressive doesn't mean you always stop out and being cautious doesn't always mean they'll work. Trading's a game of odds. Why, am I, why would I waste my time to put this in here? Because I don't want you guys to think that because occasionally you take a one minute high that's absolute utter garbage that every one of them fails. No, really super aggressive trades that you probably shouldn't take will sometimes work. Some trades that are really, really good, like you, you cross your T's, dot your I's, check, check, check on your checklist. Cautious, conservative approach, they could still fail. It's a game of odds. So we're not talking about the outliers here. We're not talking about the fringe 10% on each side. We're talking about what happens most of the time. Okay, so let's take a look. JD, aggressive or not? Well, they don't always work. Right idea, wrong time, get back in. When you look at this, let's start with the daily. This happened a couple days ago. This stock is has a gap down and basically it's under the 50 MA and when it gets under the previous day's bar, right, this little green bar right there, there's nothing but room for this thing to drop into. So when you look at this wide bar followed by two narrow bars, you don't really find much wrong with it. Now, you could make an argument and say, well, the first bar is a little bit wide, it's a dollar. It's a little more than a dollar, dollar 25, right? Now, obviously, this stock does two or three dollars a day. You can see the average trading range is roughly two to three dollars a day. So there's still plenty of range. And you didn't just get a three bar play. You got a four bar play, multiple resting bars. So when you look at the entry at 6050 and you look at the gap, this doesn't really feel like a super aggressive trade. You're taking it at 937, 938 in the morning with a pretty nice gap. But it didn't work right? Didn't work. But that doesn't mean also that you can't ever get back in this or that it's junk for the rest of the day. And that we've had, a, we did a lecture on this topic a few weeks, a month or two ago, get back in. Well, that's, that's true. You had a good pattern with a good daily. Well, the daily is still a good daily, 
right? Just because the four bar play on the two minutes stopped out, it doesn't mean the daily is all of a sudden garbage now. Focus on this idea. Your trade didn't work. Get pissed off for five seconds, regroup, and then get back to objective trading. Well, this stock came back, came down, and gives you another entry back at 6050. Now you could use the original stop if you choose, or you could use the wider stop. It's up to you, right? You can use the 35 cent stop or the 75 cent stop, whatever you want. This stock ended up going down very nicely. It ended up going almost $2, right? This actually went lower than this. You can see it went down into the 58 range. So the point though, is that this was an ag a, eh, slightly aggressive trade, but a pretty good one. Just didn't work, but it eventually worked. Get back in, okay? Here's another one, all right? TDOC started with a one minute three bar play, which is an aggressive entry. So I used the low of the day for the stop loss with the intent to add back later. After a move up, TDOC pulled back to support, gave us a retest buy setup where I added to my position and got the two R target. This trade took foresight, if I spelled it right, I don't know, and patience because the market has been so volatile. So this was an aggressive trade. But how did I mitigate the aggressiveness? I used the low of the day. Now, that may have an impact on the risk to reward because we started off with like a dollar twenty for the stop loss, dollar thirty-five. It ripped up about a dollar something, pulls back and you get a retest buy setup. So this was aggressive. It absolutely was aggressive. Okay? 37.85 by low of the day. Look at the time. Mention it right before it's triggering here. Added on TDOC at 37.80s. I've raised the stop to 36.85, and we could have raised it to 37, right? Rips up, pulls back. Well, what's so good? It pulled back to support. It triggers the buy setup here. It retests and then rips. So that's one way to mitigate aggressive trades. Use wider stops with fewer shares, maybe do a half lot and wait for a pullback. So in this can, in scenario, instead of saying, hey, I'm going to get out on a 1R pullback, right? Say it pops 1R and goes to break even. No, this way you look at it and say, I'm going to take a half lot, a half a position because I know it's aggressive and I'm going to wait for some form of pullback to get in on a retest or a buy setup and then I'm going to add. Now, why would you take a half lot and just not wait for the buy setup? Well, maybe it never pulls back. At least you have a half position at that point, right? There's always the possibility it just rips higher and never pulls back. At least you're in it with a half position. If it stops out, you only lose a half of an R and you have a low of the day stop, which has to go through all of this support to the left, which now becomes what? Your friend at 3750 right here. So that's one way to mitigate an aggressive trade, right? That's one way to mitigate an aggressive trade, okay? What about this? Safe entry but it still almost stopped. Why am I putting this in here? Guys, there's like 15 more slides of charts, so we have a lot to cover, okay? Why am I putting this in here? Well, we have a daily breakout on coin here. Watch coin over 64.50 for a swing idea back to 80-ish. Gosh, coin went to well over 100 bucks. But anyway, it's breaking out of the range. It's above the flat 50 MA. It's breaking out, which is 64.50. So right there is an entry. Right there is 64.50 is an actual entry. Nothing wrong with this entry. Give it a good stop, $2.50. It moves up, pulls back. I want to focus on this, quote, add or just the bicep. Say you missed the initial entry. Let's just say this is the first entry. What's the focal point here? The focal point is that this was a really good trade. The daily broke out great. This had a nice breakout pattern at 64.50 and it's pulling back to minor price support. What does it give you? Bottoming tail, change of color bar, narrow body bar. If the moving average was on this page, it would be on, it would be right there. It's at minor price support. It's just below a 50%, sorry, just above a 50% retracement. So when you're looking at great buy setups, they don't get much better than this. Check, 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 check. And what happened? It triggered you in on this bar right there, right? It triggered you in on that bar right there. In fact, let's do this real quick. Let's do this real quick, okay? 
Let's do this. Hold on. Just give me a second. Let's blow this bad boy up. Let's just blow it up. Okay? It triggered you in right there. Right on that bar right there. And the next bar almost stopped you out. Right? The next bar almost stopped you out. Okay? Why am I showing this though? Because even great trades with great entries, great pullbacks in great locations, all three location items, bottoming tail, doji bar, all the goods still almost tagged you. Which means you still, no matter how good the trade is, no matter how conservative the trade is, no matter how aggressive the trade is, don't take your eye off it if it stops you out. Because this almost tagged you and then what did it do? Put in the world's largest wide range green bar and rip. Let me take that off. And oh my gosh, what happened for the rest of the day? Rips went $4.50 higher. Great trades still don't always work out the way we expect. Okay, you guys saw this one from a couple, I don't know, a couple few days back, maybe a week back, something like that, okay? What do we have? Stock that's choppy off the open, rips up, pulls back. Note, bottoming tail, nice. Change of color bar, nice. Narrow body bar, nice. 40 to 50% retracement, high of the pivot, low of the pivot, right in there. Near minor price support, that's kind of the green line area. 20 period moving average, if it were there. So we have all location items, plus a few other things. So you're looking at it, and you're going, wow, I really like it. There's nothing wrong with this, right? Textbook, right? I don't find too many things wrong with it. From the limited information we have, because we're not looking at the daily, this looks pretty good. Okay, let's blow it up. Just like I did in the last slide, let's blow it up. Trading is a game of pennies. This could have easily triggered you in by one cent or perhaps you anticipated by one or two cents, then it quickly stops out, then what? We'll find out in a second, right? So you're looking at it. That's that, guys, let's go back to the last slide. Last slide, that, that's how it looked. That's how it looks. And you're going, oh, oh man, I need to get me some of that. That's this is beautiful. One bar later, it looks like this. And I don't know about you, but they look like pretty equal highs to me. Pretty equal highs. But maybe you anticipated by a penny or two and you're in it. And what's it do? Stops you out right there. Because your stop loss is the bottom of the green bar's bottoming tail. The bottom of the green bar's bottoming tail. Stops you out. And then it did that. <sighs> Are you freaking kidding me? So this is a rule, or not a rule, but this is just something to say, either give it a wider stop or get back in. Because this was not an aggressive trade. Not an aggressive trade. I'll get to the aggressive trade soon, don't worry. This is not an aggressive trade, and it still possibly shook you out depending on where your order was. If you anticipated it, you got tagged, and then it ripped, and how are you feeling now? Our edge is very small in trading. Don't kid yourself, don't get it twisted. For all the studying you do, your edge is small, but it's very important. Guys, casinos win in blackjack at casinos and with a, an edge that's less than a percent, maybe right around 1%, give or take, because they win over quantity. Right? They win over thousands, tens of thousands, millions of hands of blackjack and other games as well. In trading, our edge is better than 1%, but that's not the point. The point is it's small, so don't mess with it. Okay. Now, what about this? Aggressive versus safe. Which is which? Right? Which is which here? Well, right over here on the left-hand side, we have what I would consider to be a mega gap. I mean, this stock gapped down from like 13 bucks down to 850. It's technically a three bar play, isn't it? That's a wide range bar. There's no question that's a wide range bar for this stock. The next day, this is a daily chart. The next day, narrow range resting bar and then boom, it triggers. 
That, ladies and gentlemen, is a very aggressive trade. Very aggressive trade. Huge gap down, one resting day, and then you short it. And guess what? It worked, right? I mean, if you got in here at like $8.45 with like what looks to be a 10 or 15 cent stop loss, it dropped 50 cents. Technically, it worked. Where am I going with it? Well, in the last slide, you could see a good trade potentially failed or shook you. And on this slide, a super aggressive trade worked. But that's not what we're after. We're after the averages. So now, this stock starts to curl at the bottom here, move back up, pulls back, moves back up, pulls back. Now, we're at one of the safest areas on the chart to trade, right? We want that first pullback after a breakout. Well, you could argue right here, you could argue that's the first pullback, but it didn't really put in a higher high, right? It broke above 850, I agree, but it didn't really break the area, the gap fill $9 area that we needed. So I'm not sure I would call that the first pullback, although you could. You know, we could have a, a, a heated discussion over that. But this thing ripped higher and then pulls back. Let's go down to the orange line here. Lower high, lower high, lower high, lower high. Nice bottoming tail, at a moving average, narrow body bar. Oh my goodness. Pretty nice. Entry is right there. Stop loss is there. Rip. That's your entry right there on the next bar. This did what it was supposed to do. Okay. So this is an example of where an aggressive trade worked and a non-aggressive, very safe trade worked. But most of the time, as in all of the time, you should be waiting for this trade. That's too aggressive. We're gonna talk about aggressive trades that are acceptable. This is too aggressive in my opinion. That's a mega gap down and one resting day is just in my opinion, not enough to justify lower. Now this, this is a, a non-aggressive trade, a less aggressive trade, why? because it has confirmation, right? Right over here, he's a consolidation, 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 shakeout. The shakeout got immediately bought back up, immediately, next bar. There's your entry at 33.50, your stops at $33, boom. Gives you that two to one that you're looking for. Could you have used a tighter stop? Maybe, maybe. But this confirmation of strength makes a more reliable trade, but it's always a but. But what if you anticipated due to low volume or something else? I mean, look at this right here. What if you anticipated on that red bar there? What if you anticipated on that green bar? It's at a half number. And what if this stock had a five cent spread? And you're like, well, I don't want to do 33.51. I want to do 33.49 or 33.48. Well, most likely that red bar right here, right there, right there the red bar before the wide range red bar would have tagged you in at 3348 or 3349 it would have shook the tree stopped you out and then ripped trading is a game of pennies no this isn't about telling you not to anticipate i anticipate all of my trades my point though is that a penny here or a penny there can completely change your odds but the flip side of that the flip side is, what if you put your order at 33.51 and got skipped? <sighs> now you're chasing butterflies. You're chasing your tail, your tongue tied and twisted. You're like a pretzel. You have to pick a side, if that makes sense. I anticipate all my trades, and every once in a while, that will happen. But I'm okay. Why? I'll get right back in. I don't have a problem with that. But I'm not going to put my order at 33.51 because I'll probably get skipped or get a terrible fill right? Point though is this is a very safe trade, a very good trade, okay? But if you anticipated it, it may have still stopped you out, okay? Trading is a game of pennies, okay? All right. Extreme relative strength, calculated aggression. This is what I want you guys doing. Okay, this is an appropriate level of aggression for this gap. So now, <clears throat> what do we have? Well, let's first start with the market because that's usually the first thing we look at. When you wake up in the morning, the first thing you typically look at is what? What's the market doing, right? So market is gapping down on this day under a topping tail, under a green bar, a little bit of a pivot there, right there. Market's gapping down, okay? relatively smooth move up, so it should have room to go lower, 
Okay. What happens? This stock gaps up. It doesn't just gap up. It gaps up over a red bar topping tail, a wide range red bar, one pivot here and another pivot over here. This is a damn nice gap, like level one type gap, right? You could make an argument that that's a level one gap. The only thing you might be missing is the wide range bar, but you know, we can be a little flexible because the previous day was a wide range bar. Yesterday was mm, average bar, previous day wide range bar. Point, this is a very good gap. That's the point. It's a very, very good gap for two reasons. The gap itself is beautiful and it's in the opposite direction of a market showing extreme relative strength. What makes me go one step further to tell you this aggression is okay? The very first bar of the day. The very first bar of the day gapped up and initially went red, right? It did, you, you just know by the bottoming tail. It initially went red. So it gapped up and started to pull back, pull back. And then the buyer stepped in and said, no, 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 we, we got this. Here, hold my beer, we're good. Puts in a bottoming tail. Then the next bar is a resting bar. And for all you sticklers out there, remember a relatively equal high for a three bar play. Like I said, if it pops over a couple few pennies, you're fine. So yes, bar number two, it's blown up over here, popped over by a couple few pennies, but it's still a narrow range resting bar. Next bar comes in, triggers you, takes off. This, this is good trading right here. This is calculated aggression. And one last comment. This is a tight stop. Give it room. If this were me, I'd be giving it down. Probably I would, I would give it to 74 bucks, right? The entry here is roughly 74.50, something like that. Okay, 74, I don't know, 45. I'm gonna give it a little extra room under there. And you can see, we don't know if this thing pulled in first and then ripped. We don't know, guys. See it right there? We don't know. We just know it opened right here. It could have opened right there and immediately pulled back, or it could have triggered you in first, then almost shake you out. In fact, that's slightly lower. That's like a penny lower than the previous bar. So there is a chance that this triggered you in, shook you out, and ripped. This is why this early in the morning, you need to give them more room. Because at the end of the day, guys, if this gap does what we think it's capable of doing and what it should do, that extra 10, 20 cents on the stop loss is not gonna matter. Let me repeat it because it's profound. It's a golden nugget that sounds so damn simple. If this stock on this type of a gap does what we expect it to do, that extra 20 cents on the stop loss won't matter. Just won't, you're gonna get there anyway. And this stock went almost to $78. You can see it right here by 1.30, it was already at 76.70. And you can see by the topping tail, it went to 77.50. You're in at 74.50, that's a $3 move on a 50 cent stop. And the 50 cent stop is giving it room. It went six to one with the wide stop. I'd rather do the wide stop than stop out by a penny or two right there, see it? Depending on how it triggered. And then, Possibly add back at 75.50 over here. This is calculated aggression. That's the type of trade you need to be taking if you're going to be aggressive. Okay? This, extreme relative strength. You're allowed to be aggressive. You're allowed to be aggressive here. Now, you're going, well, geez, Jared, I mean, 945 is not. No, it's still a little bit aggressive. It's not like 931, right? But take note, this stock gaps up. The market gaps up. The market actually goes a little higher and Nike doesn't. But right here is what sells you on this. Remember we talked about Dash today and I told you what sold me on Dash was the engulfing bar on the five minute with the retest. And I typed it, I even put it on social media, I put it on stock switch. Watch um, Dash, it was like 77 bucks, I can't remember exactly, right? Why? Because that five minute engulfing bar with the buy setup on Dash today was a confirmation of strength. Well, that's exactly what Nike is here. It just peekaboos below the low today, leaves a bottoming tail and goes right back up. And what does the market do at the same damn time? Goes lower. So Nike sets up a four bar play, three or four bar play right here, right there. All while the market's going lower. And if you don't believe me, just take a look. The entry to this 
it's going to be somewhere around there. And that's what the market's doing. All right? We'll make it pink just for fun. The market's down one, two, three, four, five bars, and Nike's looking poised to go higher. So if the market ever bounces, Nike's going to explode. Now, if the market's in a free-for-all, it might be tough because the market could ruin your Nike trade. But the relative strength that this shows, while, again, being aggressive is okay, don't be too aggressive. You still need to look for confirmation signs. And what signs do we see? This shakeout bar below the low of the day, this wide range igniting bar on a little bit of increased volume takes out the high of the day all while the market is going lower. Nike doesn't care about the market on this day. It's okay to be aggressive on that. Now, pretty obvious market. You guys saw this slide a week or two ago, right? This is a market where we gap down deep into enemy territory, which is the green bar. We gap into that area. Plus, that area is also a double top, right? Double top, okay? So this is a day where it's okay. It's okay to have a bearish bias. Five green days up, near the 50 period moving average, resistance to the left, and in a general downtrend, bearish bias. So now what? Where are you going with this, Jared? I'm telling you because of the bearish bias, it's okay to be aggressive. Meta, easy market bias today, bearish. Remember, let's go back. Five green days up, 50 period moving average, resistance to the left, general downtrend. Bearish bias. Okay, let's go back. Okay. This is a nice, really nice little pre-market consolidation. So Meta opens the day and immediately goes red. But here's the beauty of Meta. Here's the beauty. Remember, we're always looking for confirmation. We have our market bias confirmation. We have Meta gapping down. Okay. Meta gapping down. We have this beautiful bearish pre-market base consolidation, guys, from 7 a.m. to 9.30 it's a two and a half hour consolidation that Meta is stuck between 166 and 168, mostly 167, right? And then what? Meta opens right there. You can see the dotted line right there. It puts in a bottoming tail. Bottoming tail means strength, right? Well, it does, unless or until it gets engulfed. And that's exactly what happened on the next bar. So what do I do? I come in and say, guys, Meta, 166.25 by 167. Now, in fairness, I probably could have used a, a little bit of a wider stop. We could have used 167.50. Probably would have been the better stop loss. Okay? Meta under 166 was also a pre-market favorite. Okay? Note on this day. Okay? Note on this day. Three of the four favorite ideas were short ideas. Meta short, win short, no. Four of the five. 80% of the ideas were short. Why? Because the market bias was very bearish. Meta triggers, pays out quick. Goes almost to 162. About $4 move, about three to one. No, more than that because it was a 75 cent stop. This thing went about six to one, five and a half to one. This is okay to be aggressive because our market bias was clear and obvious and it had a beautiful pre-market bearish consolidation and it engulfed the bottoming tail. Note, I'm trying to take what normally would be aggressive and make it less aggressive by adding confirmation to it. Okay, now, now what? Market conditions matter. You're not sure about the market? Wait. So extended 60 minute equals market likely choppy or weak. Not a great day to be aggressive unless it's a level one gap. So if you're doing your pre-market scanning and you don't have a level one gap and you see the market doing this, and I don't mean opening like this. I mean the 60 minute, one, two, three, four, five, six bars, seven bars up. What do you want to do? What's the modus operandi on a day like today? The modus operandi is simple. Wait, what are we waiting for? Waiting for the market to pick a direction or for a stock to come up on our watch list that's showing extreme strength or weakness. 
That's what we're waiting for, confirmation. Don't jump in one minute in a day. You're going to get slopped around, man. You're going to get towed in a blender. You're going to get Christmas tree lights, and you're going to hit every branch on the ugly tree on the way down. You're going to get chopped. So you wait. You wait for the market to pick a clear and concise direction, or you wait for a stock to present itself that is clearly and absolutely on its own page. If you don't see or find it, you don't take a trade. Forget the FOMO. You want to make money or not, forget the FOMO. This is not that day. This is not a day to be aggressive. Now what do we have? Aggressive, but acceptable. Nice gap. Look at the gap, right? This stock gaps down under this consolidation at 160 and under this double bottom. See the bottoming tail right there and this consolidation right here. Very nice gap. And then what do you get? Whew. You don't get pre-market charts much prettier than that. So you have a beautiful gap down and the gap is on volume and you have this insanely nice one hour consolidation in the pre-market. You are taking a one minute low the second it triggers 148.50. The second it does this and you're putting your stop loss above 150 and boom. Look at this thing. Went to 137, $11 move on a $1.50 stop. Wow. Seven, eight to one. All because the gap was nice and the pre market chart was stunning. And look at the volume come in, man. Run, horse, run. Be patient and wait for it. Well, now what do we have? ABBV gapping down below a bottoming tail. That's a good sign, right? Bottoming tail is bullish. We're below it. There's a pivot that's bullish. We're below it. We have room down to the bottom of this pink line, which is like 135. So you have basically room from 145 to 135. Basically, right? Nice gap. Probably an acceptable entry to take a two minute low at 145 but it's aggressive, right? You have to give it the high of the day, which is like 146.30 or something like that. What happens? Chops around, but the better entry is the breakdown at 144 or the sell setup at 143.25. Those are the better entries. And I get it. These are the challenging things we do as traders. You look at a gap and you're like, wow, that's a really nice gap on ABBV. I need to find a way in. I need to find a way in. And then sometimes we get a little bit too aggressive because it's not really a level one gap. It's a good gap, maybe a, a level two plus, right? But it's not a perfect gap, but it's nice. We can wait. Well, in this case, you have an entry at 10 a.m. and you have an entry at 10.15. You're not waiting that long. So while this is a good gap and would allow for a somewhat aggressive entry, patience is usually better. Patience is usually better. And in this case, it gave you two other entries. All right, and both paid out. Now, safe entry, wait for a trend to form. Why am I commenting on this? I'm commenting on this because Generally speaking, again, there are exceptions to everything we do. The longer you wait, the more clear, the clearer, however you want to say it, the clearer the picture becomes, right? Because now you're not judging your trade, okay? You're not judging your trade off of two minutes of information or three minutes of information. You're judging your trade off of 45 minutes of information, one hour of information, two hours of information. So it allows you to actually see the trend of the stock. So ExxonMobil is a great example. This was a decent gap up. It's not a great gap. It's third day up, right? It's not amazing, but it did take out this pivot to the left, right? It did take out that pivot to the left. That's good. It's got room to go higher. That's good. But again, you know, third day up, it's okay. I don't want to jump in it off the open. And you can see there's a little bit of a battle there, wasn't there? It put in a doji bar, then a green bar, then a red bar, then a little bottoming tail um, red bar, and then ripped and pulls back. Now I know this stock is strong. Yep, 
that move up is a bit much. It's not too, too much, but it's a decent move. So you don't want to buy the high, that's for sure. You want to buy a pullback. The pullback comes down to minor price support at 95.50, roughly a 50% retracement. You buy at 95.50, your stops at 95.10. Try, try to trade it back up to that 96.30 area. That gives you 80 cents, about two to one. If it goes more than that, lovely. But at that point, you're at the average trading range. But the reason I put this in here is waiting paid off here because it was a little choppy off the open and it did give you the pullback you were looking for. Kind of like Dash today. We took a very aggressive trade on Dash. It went one and a half R, stopped us out at break even. It actually would have taken a full stop if we didn't get out at break even, right? And then it gave a beautiful five minute buy setup later, retest buy setup that went 2R. So waiting on Dash probably would have been the better idea, right? So the safer entries generally are when you have more information to pull from because that more information gives you more confirmation. Make sense? Okay, so that's what I want you guys to look at when we think and talk about being aggressive with your trading, right? Aggressive doesn't always mean a bad trade. But you must understand what you're doing so that you aren't surprised if it whips you out or stops out quickly. What does this basically mean? Know the expectation, right? In layman's terms, to make it quick and short, know the expectation. If you're going to take a one minute high, know that even with a level one gap, you might get whipped out because the range of that one minute bar might be rather narrow. And you might get whipped out and watch the stock trend higher for the entire rest of the day and tell me there's nothing more frustrating than that. Taking what's perceived to be a very good trade, getting whipped out, and then you watch the stock go higher for the rest of the day. It's annoying, right? So know what you're trading. Know the spread. Know the whippiness, the volatility. Know the volume, the liquidity. Know the area in which you're taking it. Know the market conditions. Know the gap. You have to put all these things together. If you don't, you're going to be cruising for a bruising. So not all pre-market charts lead to one and two minute high entries. Pick and choose your spots carefully. When should we wait? If there's no edge to the pre-market chart, if the gap is not great and requires more time, think level three gaps. Okay. If the stock is too illiquid to trade early on, guys, we have this happen all the time. Snow is a good example from a week or two ago. The stock had like a $3 spread off the open. Well, that means you gotta take a $10 stop loss, $12 stop loss. Well, that kind of hurts your risk to reward, doesn't it? Gotta wait for it to calm down. Wait for the spread to come in a little bit to $1 instead of $3, right? If the spread isn't manageable, we just talked about it. If the pre-market pattern never triggers an early entry, maybe the pre-market pattern never triggers. What are we waiting for in all trading at all times? Not just early on, but all the time. We're waiting for more confirmation because more confirmation means equals more reliability. We're waiting for more volume to come in. In the very, very beginning of the day, the first two or three minutes of the day, there's overnight orders filled, so there can be a lot of volume. But at the same time, if the volume isn't coming in at that time, we have to wait for more volume to come in, right? Slightly higher odds play, potentially on a higher time frame. Maybe the one minute is just too aggressive for that level gap or that spread. Let's just wait. Wait till 9.45. Wait till 10 o'clock. Wait till you have more information. Maybe a higher time frame pattern will formulate. Three and four bar, bar plays are ideal for early morning momentum trades, but with good gaps. The biggest problem with three and four bar plays is the stop loss is really tight. And having a tight stop loss early in the morning with illiquid stocks and spreads that aren't manageable is really, really tough. Really challenging to do that. So this is why you'll see occasionally I'll use the low of the day instead of bar number two's low. I'll use the low of the day instead of bar number two's low. But these are things you must consider. Okay, and remember, I'll go all the way back for a second. Okay, all the way back up. Remember, combinations it's not just one thing they are combinations of things the type of trade it is the time frame in which you take it on the type of gap it was whether it has a large spread or a low volume all of a sudden you're starting to put these things together and it either makes the trade less aggressive 
or it makes the trade more aggressive. More aggressive would be a one minute climactic with a widespread using one minute bar by bar management and maybe low liquidity, but it wouldn't be a great climactic if it did. Okay, so those are the things that you just need to consider putting it all together. Okay, when you take any trade, but very, very much so when you take an early aggressive trade, you need to be more in tune, you need to be more um, focused because things happen so quickly. You can take nasty slippage. And you know what also happens quickly? Re-entries. So you may stop out quick, but the re-entry may happen quick too. Literally within a minute of getting stopped out sometimes, you may get re-entered back into the trade. Okay? So there's a lot there, and I'm going to be honest, I could probably have made an entire course out of today's topic. I probably could have spent six hours talking about this topic because I, I had about 10 more examples and I said, I have to draw the line somewhere. You know, I think an hour of this information is enough, um, but there's so many more details to this. Um, but I hope that today was detailed enough to help take your trading to the next level. And the next time you think about that one minute high, the next time you think about that one minute three bar play, the next time you think about buying it in the pre-market, think again. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying, really think it through. Do I want to be this aggressive? Do I need to be this aggressive? And if so, what justification do I have for being so aggressive? Okay, those things matter. And I think it'll keep you out of a lot of early bad trades and also build your confidence level that 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 you will be able to find a trade 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later. I'm telling you this because one of the biggest proponents of aggressive trades is FOMO. You're thinking to yourself, if I don't take it now, I'm never going to get a chance to take it again. Wrong. Most of the time, 80% of the time, the stock will give you an alternate entry later on, I promise you. All right. I'm Jared Wesley of Live Traders. I hope you guys learned a little. We'll get back at it again next week.